So I hope we are all ready to start. Welcome to the EuroRap lunchtime seminar number one, crash risk mapping in the UK and Croatia. My name is Olivera Rosi and I will be your host today. This is the first of Europe's lunchtime seminar series, which will provide information about the EuroRap protocols through the RAP basics online seminars, insight into IRAP research and innovation through our hot topic seminars and inspiration for EuroRap program through our national scheme spotlight seminars. Along with, the, with a national scheme forum, these three seminars types will be presented in rotation, giving us food for thought every month. Uh, I wish your time in seminar will be well spent and we'll have the opportunity to discuss after the presentation and answer all your questions sent in the questions and answers text box during the event. So please note, you won't be able to unmute yourself, uh, but you will be, or your questions are very much welcome. And uh, you won't only be able, but we are looking forward for your questions in question and answer text box during the event. A um, couple of housekeeping notes, uh, probably all of, all of us are already, all of you are already uh, very familiar with Zoom. Uh, you can uh, use text uh, as said questions and answer textbook for your questions. This webinar will last for approximately 60 minutes. Uh, it can be either shorter or a bit longer in case we have a lot of questions to answer. And um, I really wish you uh, a nice time during our, our seminar. Today, we have uh, with us two presenters, Brian Luton, he is the Road Safety Foundation's Research and Program Manager. Uh, the Road Safety Foundation is the license holder for UK and Ireland for Europe and has been undertaking crash risk mapping for 20 years. Since joining RSF, Brian has been responsible for some improvements to the crash risk mapping approach and bring his wealth of road safety policy experience alongside his mathematical skills to the table. Hello, Brian. Hi, how are you? Hi, Ali. I'm good. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for joining us for today's Europe lunchtime seminar. And our second speaker is Marco. Shevrovich. Marco is uh, the head of the Department of Transport Planning at the University of Zagreb. He is chartered transport engineer and licensed road safety auditor in Croatia. Um, University of Zagreb is a Europe center of excellence. This is worth noting as well. He's uh, splitting his time between University of Zagreb and IRA, European Institute for Road Assessment, which I represent as well, uh, where he fills in the position of senior road safety engineer. Marco, thank you for joining. Welcome. How are you? I'm fine, Oliveira. Thank you. And thanks, everyone, for joining. Thank you. So I think we shouldn't further delay this introduction note. And let's go uh, immediately to your interesting presentations. Uh, Brian will explain the benefit of crash risk mapping. He will explain how this is done and will give an overview of the British results to illustrate how it has been used after his presentation. If there are some questions, we can answer them. Thank you very much, Brian. Over to you. Can you hear me? I'm not sure whether I've unmuted myself. Yes, we can yeah, hear you very fantastic. well. Thank, thank you, you, Brian. Thanks, Ali. So, thank you for the introduction, Ali, and, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm going to talk about, uh, about we, as Ollie said, we're mainly talking about crash risk mapping. So um, I just want to distinguish that in, in people's minds from what you might often hear us talking about, which is the star rating. So two almost very, well, very separate things in a way. Uh, so crash risk mapping is all about historic crashes, the crashes that have actually happened uh, on the network. And it's all about measuring crash risk based on what's happened. Uh, so on the left hand side here, you can see you can see a bit of our, our map from Britain and a bit of a zoomed in version as, as well of, of different modes. Um, and then on, on the right hand side here, just to make the distinction, star rating is all about surveys of the road and um, what the risk uh, factors are on the road. And you can see some of the ones that we score in star rating. So we're, we're focused here on the left hand side on, um, on, on crash risk mapping. Um, and um, I just put this together the other day for, for, for some colleagues who um, just to help distinguish the two, but I'll, I'll just run down very quickly the crash risk mapping column here, rather than the star rating one. So in the UK, we, we crash risk map every motorway and A road each year. 
not only said RSF, the Road Safety Foundation, are the license holder for um, for the UK. Um, we publish all our results on our, on our, on our website, rsfmaps.agilisys.co.uk. Um, Agilisys are, are our data partners in the UK, so they, they provide um, the data for us and do a lot of the, the hard work behind the scenes for us. As I say, all of crash risk mapping is based on historic crash numbers, crashes that have actually happened. And we tend to talk about um, routes. Um, I'll, I'll explain what I mean about the difference between routes and links later on, but we tend to focus on, on, on routes in the UK. Um, uh, other people might might use different terminology, but as I say, I'll clarify that later on. Um, we tend to focus on individual risk, uh, what we call individual risk for the crash rate. So this is fatal and serious injury crashes per vehicle kilometre. So FSI crashes per vehicle kilometre. So this is risk to individuals using the road per kilometre that they travel. Um, we sometimes talk about collective risk as well, which is what I call crash density. So that's where it's just FSI crashes per kilometre road length. Um, so that's giving an idea of, um, yeah, how how uh, close together crashes are basically, and uh, I'll touch briefly on on what I call the investment case later on, which is where we talk about BCR benefit cost ratio top ten percent of routes, for example. Um, but yeah, I just want to emphasise crash risk mapping is what we're talking about today. Don't get confused with star rating, which is something different but related. Um, so just our crash risk maps. You've already seen a, a, a small excerpt from one. Basically, we, we rank routes from low risk in green through yellow, orange, red, up to black, high risk. Um, and you can see some examples of, of each of those colours, I think, on this map here uh, from, from Yorkshire in, in, uh, in England. As I say, we tend to focus on individual risk. So we're looking at the number of crashes resulting in fear, fatal or serious injury per vehicle, vehicle kilometres travelled. Um, as I say, we do all motorways and A roads now, um, and we've got about 4,000, getting on for 4,000 4, routes. Um, so this is a slightly zoomed out version of some of our map. Um, why motorways and A roads, you might ask? Um, it's because they form about 13% of road length, but actually they account for 60% of road deaths. So more than half of road deaths are on our motorway and A road network. So the two sort of highest tier uh, levels of road in the UK. Um, one other thing to say here is, is we always look over three years, and that's just to make sure our crash numbers are a little bit more robust. So the latest results we've published are for 2017 to 2019, uh, the three-year period, 2017, 2018, and 2019. Um, and you can find all of this on our, on our website. Um, if you literally go to roadsafetyfoundation.org under tools, you'll find a link to our crash risk mapping data portal. Um, so each year we identify significantly improved routes. I, I won't go through the details uh, of these in turn, um, but, uh, but you can see three highlighted on this route. One's section of motorway, uh, one's quite an urban road, and one's quite a rural road. If you've heard of Barnard Castle, I think it's somewhere around here at the bottom of, of, of this yellow one here. So I don't know whether you can see where I'm pointing, I meant here. <laughs> um, the most significant improved route we, we had last year uh, with a huge reduction in the number of fatal and serious collisions uh, of more than two thirds was the A3095 in Bracknell. So this highlighted road in light blue, or cyan, I suppose, uh, that goes through the middle of Bracknell. Uh, it's, got a, it's got a split in it because there's another road that goes across the middle and that's, that's so it's, it's not one complete road. There's a short break in the middle, um, but um, you can see actually over, over time, the flow has been increasing very gradually on this road. Um, the black here is the black line here is the number of uh, fatal and serious crashes, but we've also got on here the total number of crashes resulting in injury. So you can see from 2014 to 2016 the numbers were going up, and then we had a sudden big reduction in 2017, and it's continued to go down since to 2019. Um, and there were various reasons for that. Um, there were speed limit reductions. There were various improvements made to the roadside edge. Um, yeah, and uh, lighting and various other improvements. So we we always identify the improvements because we want to celebrate success and and the fact that um, the fact that the roads got better for good reason. Um, as well as identifying significantly improved routes, we identify what we call persistently higher risk routes. So there are a few criteria in here, but one of them is that basically the road has to be in in one of the two worst bands in both three year periods. In this case, twenty fourteen to sixteen. And 2017 to 2019. So you can see the one at the top of this list was in the red band, so the second worst band um, in the previous three years. And then in the most recent three years, 
it's actually deteriorated into the into the lowest band. Um, we identify crash types for each each route, so you can see that nine percent of the of the crashes on this route, for example, will involve motorcycles. Um, and you can also see this column is is just highlighting whether they're part of the safer roads fund, which I'll touch on later. You can see there's one in the middle that was. Um, the other the other four here weren't. Um, I'll come back to that later on. Um, this is just to give you a bit of an overview of some of the graphs we present, some of the results we present. So um, again, we've got 2014 to 16 at the top, 2017 to 2019 at the bottom. And you can see between the top and the bottom, we've actually had an increase in the amount of green and the amount of yellow. So the, the lowest risk routes and a decrease in the amount of black. So the highest risk routes. So, so in other words, the network as a whole is improving. Um, and that matches with the fact that the number of crashes has been reduced by around 10% across the network as a whole. Um, so there's been a 10% reduction in crashes and we've seen a shift towards safer roads. So that, that tallies. Um, just this, just, this is just a flag we can, we can split by various ways. So this, in this case, we're splitting Britain into, into its three uh, country parts. So England, Scotland, and Wales. And we can then see the differences between England, Scotland, and Wales in terms of the results. Um, and there's good reasons for the differences. They're not, it's not about um, sort of saying, well, this country's doing well and this country's doing badly. There are different challenges in different parts of the United Kingdom. Um, and this, this, this is just splitting. We've got England, Scotland and Wales split, but also strategic and local roads split. So you can see the crash rate on strategic roads in each of the three countries is, is much lower than on the local road network. That makes sense. Our busiest roads we spend most on in terms of making as safe as possible. Um, and again, we can split at the network level by, in this case, urban, rural and motorway into different crash types. So you can see, for example, the urban roads, the most common crash type is vulnerable road users. That's pedestrians, cyclists and horse riders. Not that there are many of them. Um, on rural roads, the most common crash type is at, at junctions, intersections. Um, but it, it's very different. And on motorways, the most common crash type we have now in the UK is on uh, is, is rear end shunts. So where someone drives into the back of someone else. Um, and, and that's partly because uh, what's happened over time is that we've eliminated a lot of other crashes on, on motorways. So, for example, runoffs, there aren't as many runoffs as, as they used to be. There aren't that many intersection or uh, vulnerable bows user crashes because uh, because of the way that they're designed head-ons are virtually eliminated so that, that it's not that they're that shunts are a particularly high risk it's the motorways are relatively safe and actually shunts are kind of the biggest group that are left um, we can also see how crash rate changes over time in different parts uh, in different parts of the country so overall there was a 13 percent decrease in crash rate so that, that's kind of tallying with the 10% decrease in crash numbers because there was also a traffic flow increase. That's why this number is bigger than 10% here. Um, but you can see that that reduction applies in all three parts of, the, of Britain. Um, and we can split that within England. We often look by region to get more of a granular, uh, granular idea. Um, that was the changing crash rate. This is the actual crash rate having had the change. So you can see how different parts of the country are, are, are performing. Um, and again, there'll be reasons why there were differences in performance. It, it's not about shaming people. It, it's about it's about learning lessons from where things are going well. Um, that's all crash rates and, and a very quick canter through. And this is just looking at what I call crash density, so the collective risk. So this is per kilometre of road length rather than um, the label on the side is wrong here, I think, um, rather than the crash rates that we had uh, that we've been looking at so far. So you can see here that uh, the English roads, the crash density is, is a lot higher in England, whether on strategic or local roads than in, in Scotland and Wales. Um, so yeah, that's just a different way of looking at, uh, at risk. Um, and I, I've started to sort of play with this concept of, of this matrix of individual risk versus collective risk. So the crash rate versus the crash density. Um, and I, I should thank someone who's on the call because he's helped helped to inspire this slide in my thinking. Um, so thank you, Stuart, for your for your contribution as, as we've thought about some of these issues. I think sometimes people aren't sure what they mean by risk. And I think this is why I talk about individual risk versus collective risk, because it depends whether you're looking at it from the point of view of the road user or a road authority. Um, so you might have a road that's relatively high risk for someone using it 
but very if very few people use it you won't actually have that many crashes on it um so it feels like it's high risk but it might actually not have that many crashes on it um or you know, the the other extreme is that a road might be really low risk but um um but have high collective risk and that's because although per user it's really uh, really safe you've just got so many vehicles using it that actually the number of crashes adds up um, so th this is this isn't about prioritization of risk at this point the prioritization of roads it's just to get an idea that actually individual risk the crash rates as people might refer to it isn't always the most useful measure and i'll come back to a little bit more about that in, in a moment um, just moving on to the safer roads fund which i mentioned earlier so this was a scheme set up in 2017 um, where, where our Department for Transport, our, our central, our government body basically said, we'll, we're going to spend money to improve the 50 worst roads. Um, and they totaled around 700 kilometres of network. Um, the roads were selected on the basis of our crash risk mapping. So they, they took the 50 at the top of our individual risk map um, and said, they're the ones we're going to fund. So it wasn't a competitive fund. Um, which, which in the UK at least things often are, so that that changed people's perceptions a little bit. Basically, they just had to show that they were going to do something worthwhile, rather than them competing. And if they got the money, someone else didn't. It, it wasn't like that. All fifty were able to get the funding. Um, and as you can see, it was started in 2017, uh, 2018, um, and there were various aims of, of that fund. So this is just looking at the individual risk again. Uh, in, in a different way. Basically, we're taking routes that were black routes, the highest risk routes, and we're trying to move them down towards, towards the bottom end, the green and yellow, where, where things are a lot safer. Um, it was all about targeting these high risk routes. Um, there were various other things involved in, um, in what the fund was trying to do. So it's all about building capacity for safe system delivery, being more proactive and encouraging collaboration. I won't run you through this slide. Essentially, what the what we did was was star rate the fifty as a way of then um, working out what improvements to make to the fifty. Um, but I won't go into the detail of that because that's going to confuse. The idea is we're focusing on the highest risk individual routes, um, and out of that came all sorts of treatments. Um, so a lot of bends were improved, speed limits were reduced in some cases. Um, pedestrian fencing, uh, pedestrian footpaths were improved, cycle routes were improved, crossings, um, any number of things. And overall, um, the government put in around £100 million pounds, um, between uh, 2018 and, and 2021. So this, is, this slide's slightly out of date now, but they put in about around £100 million. And we estimated, based on our model, that, that 1,450 lives and serious injuries might be prevented over the next 20 years. Um, which is huge, a huge number in itself, um, but also has a financial value, we think, of around £550 million. So actually, even economically, there was a really strong return here. Per, per pound spent, um, we estimate that the country as a whole is going to benefit to the tune of more than £4 pounds per pound spent. Um, and actually, since, since we did that, we've started to look at um, we've, we've, we've tried to improve, if you like, the way that investment packages might be selected. So, I mean, the, the detail of this table isn't particularly important here, but, the, but what we start to do is try and highlight, if you like, the 10% of roads within a given road network that are the most likely to have a good uh, financial return. So this is all about justifying money for investment from uh, ultimately our, our treasury, our central government financial department. Um, identifying the types of roads that would be likely to have good returns to justify investment that would save lots of, uh, prevent lots of uh, deaths and serious injuries, but also have a really good financial return. So you, you can see we've just got the, the network split by various types here to just to get an idea of how it varies in different parts of the country. Just very briefly, I'll run you through, if you like, a bit more detail about our the, the way that we go through the process in the UK, and I'm, I'm sure there'll be similarities with uh, with what Marco talks about later on. So uh, this is our kind of our, our how-to guide, if you like, that we're starting to develop. So what, one of the things that we have to do each time is uh, at the beginning, sorry, the process is obtain the license. So as, as Ollie said earlier, uh, the Road Safety Foundation are the license holders for crash risk mapping in the UK. Um, 
we then go through identifying our target audience and our objectives and planning our reporting. You've seen some of the graphs that uh, that we present, but working out, if you like, what some of the strategic messages are and who we're aiming at is, is so key. Um, the fields of interest is, is really worth thinking about. So in our case, we split strategic and local roads. We split English, Scottish, Welsh roads. Um, we often split rural and urban, not always for, for good reason. Um, but it's all about identifying which fields we need to segregate the data by in order to work out how we segment the network. And what we then do, because we have flow data and crash data at a very, at a very local level, we end up with lots of really short links that we can then join together. So we can have a strategic route that's, that's many miles long, that's consisting of lots of individual links. So we work out, if you like, the average crash rate or the average crash density on that, on that route as a whole. Um, but it's based on much smaller links. So we can drill down to the data at the, at the link level um, if we need to. Um, the reason we want to uh, join lots of links together is, is simply statistical ro uh, for statistical robustness. So on, on a small number of links, if you only have one or two links in a route, uh, then it's really hard to, to prove anything statistically. You know, your numbers might change in terms of crashes from one to zero. And actually, you don't know whether that's an improvement or not, because that could have happened by, by chance. Um, Whereas across the route as a whole, you'll get something that's much more robust, you know, a change from 20 to, to 30 crashes is obviously a worsening in terms of um, the risk. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of some of the things that you have to think through, just an overview of when you're setting up crash risk mapping in a country. And then some of these things that we have to revisit each time. So obviously we renew our license every now and then. Um, we we re, um, we restructure the network from time to time as as uh, travel patterns and crash patterns change, just to keep uh, live, if you like, to the to the network and making sure that it's relevant to the uh, road authorities that we're working with. Um, and then each year we go through this process, or rather, our our um, data uh, provider, Agilisys, do this for us. So they assign crashes to the network. So it's specifically identifying which road each crash is on, identifying its crash type, so we can then classify it as we event shunt or head on or whatever, and obviously the severities as well. Alongside that, they obtain uh, the flows for each route, the amount of traffic using each route. And then they, they provide that to us. We put it into a, a template which does all sorts of calculations. Um, including um, calculating our calibration factors. So, so we, we have to calibrate the network and we now do rural and urban separately. Um, and that, that seems to have improved, if you like, the reliability of some of our findings. Um, but the template also works out things like which routes are therefore the most significantly improved or which routes are coming up persistently high risk. Um, and that's what we mean here by routes of interest. And we, we take uh, real care about consulting with road authorities before we go to public publication. So we identify not just the top 10 of, of the significantly improved routes, but, but actually the top 20, 25 routes. And we consult on all of them. And the reason for that is that the consultation sometimes highlights that, um, you know, we've classified a crash wrong. You know, we've assigned a crash to a, a crash to a particular route and it wasn't on that route you know, is on a different route and our, our methodology for signing crashes hasn't quite captured it right. Um, and also uh, part of the reason for consultation is to find out what improvements have been made on the road or what improvements might be planned on the road. Um, and um, also because it gives the road authority advanced warning that we're going to publish something that that, that may give them, um, well, credit or indeed give them an amount of uh, questioning, if you like, by media around uh, around what's gone wrong on the road that is in our persistently high risk route list. Um, so then following that consultation, we basically go through another iteration, updating the data. And then we spend a bit of time planning exactly how we're going to present which maps, um, because there are all sorts that we could produce. We could include like crash risk map, yes, at the side, the crash rate map, which is what we tend to do, but also the crash density map. Um, we've also played with economic maps um, that show the, the values of prevention on, uh, on different routes. So that's slightly different again. And then more recently, as I say, the investment side of things, we've, we've produced an investment map, which highlights the routes where we're most likely, where we think we're most likely to be able to get a financial uh, benefit from from investment so that takes real planning um and Brian, that then also 
Yeah, this Sorry, is Brian, my last double. slide, so we're all good okay, on it. Okay, great. Perfect time. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so yeah, the, the um, just planning is, is is so key. I can't emphasize it enough. I think that's that's my biggest learning experience of, of improve improve our planning, um, and that really applies both to the reporting and design of the report uh, to make it a really good, high quality product. Um, to the launch event as well, making sure that uh, that we've got interesting presentations that we're really driving home some of the key messages, some of which we've seen earlier on. Um, we we often get a fair bit of media coverage, um, so we might have interviews about particular roads. Um, and even though, as Ollie said, we've been doing this 20 years, there's still lots more for us to learn. So, so we always do a, a lessons learned at the end of the process just to feed in and improve our processes further. And I think that is it. Uh, that's my email address, but feel, I'm very happy to take any questions now if we have time, Ollie. Thank you, Brian. Uh, such an interesting and inspiring presentation. Uh, I haven't seen any questions at the moment. Maybe people are a little bit shy. Please don't be shy. You can post your questions and we'll be happy to answer them either during the event or after the event. Uh, anyway, if you happen to have any questions after uh, the event, we will, of course, uh, be happy to receive them through email and uh, respond to you. Um, I, uh, if I may just uh, uh, use this uh, opportunity because <laughs> I am sharing this uh, to, to, to know that um, uh, it's an excellent and amazing work you are doing in, in, in the UK. And uh, it seems I, I took a couple of notes, but um, it seems what is important, uh, not shaming people, but learning lesson and working together with, with the road authorities. I would take this as a message um, for, for myself. Yeah, um, I think but, on that, Oli, mm -hmm. it, it, it's really interesting. I think we've learned over the years that actually what, we, what it's all about is supporting road authorities to get funding to improve roads that are high risk. And it's all about providing them with the information they need and the scientific backing, if you like, to, to justify investment to, to their bosses or to central government or whoever. It's all about, you know, a positive message of there are things that can be done about these roads to improve them further or, you know, things have been done and they've worked really well. Look, it can be done. It's really highlighting the positive. Yeah, thank you, Brian. And if I also may add here uh, a question to you, how difficult is to do uh, crash risk mapping. I mean, what kind of um, capacities does Europe members need in order to perform themselves? Uh, well, I'd be really interested in Marco's view on that later on, perhaps. Um, certainly, what, what I found, as I say, I, I, I now am much more conscious about the amount of planning that's needed in, the pro in a project. So, for instance, we're starting right now with, with planning our um, with with the start of our project for for our launch next year in the in the summer next year, um, so we're starting to plan our network, refine our network, um, starting to get the data uh, organised uh, because it takes time and an effort and the consultations key I think, and um, the consultation is really useful in its own right actually with many local authorities. Um, sometimes they say, well, we didn't realise this road was high risk, or indeed that, that this road had improved. We're really pleased that that's come, you know, that that's showing through. Um, so, yeah, I, I think time is really important, but I, I experience it certainly helped me. Um, I, I think the understanding of, of crash rate versus crash density is something that we've learned over the years and, and has really helped us improve, if you like, the way we're, we're talking about things. Um, and the investment case, um, understanding economics is really, really helpful as well. Um, I come from very much from a mathematical background, so uh, I, I've added to, to my colleagues' knowledge in terms of engineering solutions. Um, and and hopefully between us we've got we've got the sort of complementary skills to to really help with, uh, as I say, with helping road authorities justify investment. Thanks, Brian. If this story has inspired anyone and want to start risk mapping in your country, just please bear in mind that uh, RSF is um, uh, part of the management committee of Europe, and Susie Chairman, uh, executive director there, is. Um, available and uh, together with me, we are happy to help you and support you in your path toward starting risk mapping in your country. Thank you, Brian. And then I, I think we shall give the floor now to Marco 
Uh, Marco will present Croatian case study and how risk mapping has been done uh, in a recently finalized SLAIN project. He will showcase how risk mapping can be combined with star rating to select investment priorities. I think this is very interesting to all of us uh, in the European Union, as this is one of the requirements of the new reason directive. So attention, everyone, Marco, floor to you. Yes, thanks, Oli, definitely. Um, I'll start with uh, this, this one nice picture of, uh, of a road that I will be showcasing in one of the examples. And as you can imagine, it's a, of course a one-star road with uh, high risk uh, levels in, in terms of risk mapping. So it might look nice, but in terms of road safety is quite dangerous. So I'll um, basically start here with um, why we use crash uh, risk mapping uh, in Croatia. I, I have to say here we are, um, uh, the first uh, crash risk uh, map was done somewhere uh, in uh, 2011, and it was supported by uh, HACK, the Croatian Automobile Club, uh, who, who back then realized that there is this uh, um, methodology uh, uh, developed by uh, Eurorap and IRAP back then, who, who could actually help them as a, as a let's say, a community to, to uh, show to the to the public that you know some roads are riskier than the others and uh, the good thing about that is actually that those maps are uh, quite simple to understand so there is a, a color coding five uh, different colors ranging from black to green uh, showing you exactly uh, what is the risk of uh, driving on a particular road and um, the reason uh, behind it is is that um, the, the automobile clubs accepted this because they, they wanted to communicate uh, to their users on how, how to actually uh, choose a route uh, from point A to point B with the lowest, lowest risk. And uh, in that sense, it is quite important here to say that uh, the color-coded maps, there are different types of map, maps, as Brian was uh, uh, telling already, but uh, the two maps that we are, let's say, uh, most likely to observe are the individual road users so, and the community as a whole a risk which is presented uh, on a particular road. Uh, the other thing is also um, with the historical way of dealing with infrastructure road safety and the black spot management, this in a way is a transition from the traditional uh, waiting for people to get uh, uh, injured and killed on some locations to do something to a more proactive way of actually trying to identify sections which are more more prone to to crashes than other sections so this was kind of a step between uh, uh, the black spot uh, management and and what we have now with the new reason directive the network wide road safety assessments uh, so the basic idea is in about identifying the high risk uh, uh, routes. One other aspect of uh, road uh, of uh, crash risk mapping is that it actually allows uh, the comparison between uh, relative risk within a country, but it also can uh, be used to compare risk uh, between countries. So depending on how you do the calibrations of the of the risk bands, you can actually calibrate uh, to identify roads which are above a. Um, certain uh, median value of a country, but you can also put it on the same uh, risk bending as, as other countries and you can actually compare uh, how the roads are performing in each and every country. And here I would also say one of the things which, which um, came to, to, to as a very important is that uh, the road safety countermeasures are usually and only effective if applied at locations where actual crashes happen. So that's why we still need crash risk mapping uh, with all of the proactive methodologies, the crash risk mapping actually enables us to maybe better calibrate uh, the investments in the future. So it's it's a quite a complex situation. So I usually more like to, to show this graph. So it's the star rating protocols, you know, where you uh, look at the road, you collect the attributes and you calculate how this road performs in terms of the, the uh, features of the road and you combine it with the actual crashes which are happening on that road. And that's actually the, the, the driving force behind the safer uh, road investment plans. And it ensures that the money that you're investing is actually returning values to the society. The risk mapping, uh, since we are collecting all accidents, 
uh, we definitely collect accidents which are linked to all three main pillars of road safety. So an accident is always a combination of a user interaction with vehicle and the road. And so if we collect the number of accidents, we are basically collecting all three different um, user pillars as, as um, I would say road safety pillars as, as the main causes of um, traffic accidents. And the thing is, uh, I will show you later why this is important because we can identify, we can use risk mapping to actually identify locations where road is the contributing factor or is the factor that can be, uh, uh, let's say, uh, um, changed in order to, to uh, improve road safety on a particular location. So in the first uh, case study example that I wanted to show is some of the results from the project SLAIN. As uh, Oli mentioned, that was a project that was co-financed by the Correcting Euro Facility of the European Union. And uh, we had uh, partners from different countries, Croatia, Italy, uh, Greece, Spain, and um, of course, uh, uh, Europe uh, as, as a lead partner there. So in Croatia, the project was supported by the, the, the road authorities, the main road authorities, the Croatian motorways and the Croatian roads. And also we had external partners as uh, the Croatian Automobile Club and uh, Ministry of Interior. Uh, um, so we covered the trans-European road network. Uh, the network was uh, 146 different sections, uh, 1,600 uh, uh, kilometers of roads in total. Uh, some of them were, of course, dual carriageways. So we had uh, 1,250 kilometers of motorways and only 350 kilometers of state roads, which are single carriageways that were covered by this lane project. So in the uh, SLAIN project we produced uh, two maps. One is the first map is the crash risk per vehicle kilometer travel. Um, and it's basically a map of individual risk. And you can see um, here on the right hand side how, of course, uh, some of the roads are color coded in green, some of them are yellow. And also, we have some uh, black sections and red sections. And for those of you who actually know, Croatia, you can immediately, even from the map, see that there is a high correlation with the good coloring being the motorways and the bad coloring actually being the single carriageway roads, which are uh, very similar to the one that I showed on the beginning. If we look at the map two that takes into account the rates of traffic accidents occurrence, uh, you can see that the situation is a little bit different, but um, on this map, we are expressing the number of fatal and severe injury crashes per kilometer per year. So we, we don't take into account the, uh, the traffic volumes here. But again, uh, there are some roads that are, um, especially motorways, are shifting from low risk uh, or medium risk categories to um, a medium high risk or high risk depending on the actual number of crashes which are occurring on that road. But um, the, the conclusion here would be that um, on the motorways, uh, we do have ADT values that are uh, on average uh, six and a half thousand vehicles per day higher, but the individual risk rates are more than four times higher on single carriageways. Uh, the crash density, on the other hand, is about 2.5 times higher on the single carriageway roads than on the dual carriageway roads. And um, I'm sure that this does not come as a surprise to anyone, but uh, these are the numbers and these are the values which are actually uh, proving that, of course, the dual carriageways are uh, uh, much safer than the single carriageways in terms of uh, the number of crashes which occur in them. Also, in the SLAIN project, uh, we did a trial. So uh, two different um, uh, time periods were used, three-year time periods were used. And you can see here from the total network, that was, the TNT network that was observed, that um, if we observe the period from 2014 and 2018, we had um, a slight decrease of, uh, let's say, uh, the the uh, uh, roads which are categorized in the, the low risk band. So uh, in the in the years that were uh, in the three years uh, that were after the, the initial period. So basically, only two years stayed in the same period because of the duration of the project. 
you can see that we, we had uh, a slight change in that category. The other categories uh, are, are also shifted uh, uh, to one side. And that's uh, mainly because in 2019, it was, uh, we had a, it was one of the best years in terms of tourism. There was uh, an increase of uh, um, traffic volumes of uh, almost 6%. And uh, if you compare it to the 2014, which was in, in, in that sense um, lower than that, uh, it actually changed the bands of the risk maps uh, without actual, let's say, uh, works done on the road. And this is something that also needs to be taken into account because when you're observing risk mapping, you are also observing the changes in, uh, in, in, in total mobility of a country. So something that was quite relevant. And um, in my second example, um, I will be showing a one uh, project where we are, we were actually combining the IRAP star ratings and the risk mapping to set priorities. And we had a case study on the D8 road between uh, Stobrecha and Omish, between Split and Omish actually, where we um, try to, um, let's say, identify roads where we uh, want to, uh, or, or sections of the roads where we want to invest. Um, so the thing here is that if you have two maps, two values, if you have a map that is showing uh, risk based on the uh, historical crashes, and you have a proactive map which you derived from the uh, video surveys, uh, so this basically the star rating. So to take the conclusions, uh, we prepared a matrix like this where you can actually uh, get some ideas on what should be done on the road. So for example, if you have a section of the road which is high risk in terms of crash risk, and only one star in terms of star rating, then it's highly likely that uh, this is a, 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 a road which clearly uh, and likely is a factor in terms of road safety. You should target the investment, improving road safety, and it is very highly likely that uh, any investment in this road will be very cost-effective. So you will observe a reduction of the number of crashes. But on the other hand, if you have a very low crash risk, so not a lot of accidents actually happening on a road, but the star rating is one star, then the road design is definitely unsafe, but the crash rate is very low. And that is probably because the road is so dangerous. It looks so dangerous that the people are taking extra care. This of course has effect on the mobility because usually on those roads, people are avoiding driving on those roads and they are, if they are driving, they are driving slowly. That has a, again, a negative impact on the total mobility. So investments here should be targeted in a way that you should uh, increase the, the star rating of the road, but especially take into consideration that by increase, uh, increasing the, the roadside features, you can, you might increase the operating speed and you can actually uh, make things worse. So this is something that I would say, this is a special uh, case uh, for attention. So in the situations like this, if you want to increase the star rating, you might get um, a, a wrong effect. You also have to take into account the operating speed uh when you're doing that um the third case is if you have a high risk rate but you have a very safe road it's a five-star road then likely as i was mentioning before road is you is not the factor probably there are some other factors like uh, speeding drinking uh, fatigue or or uh, vehicle safety factors that are contributing to the very high number of uh, accidents occurring on the road but road is definitely not a factor and so you only need to ensure that you maintain the road at a high standard that it actually is and of course the last um, uh, case is if you have a low crash risk and star rating is very high, it's a five-star road, then road infrastructure is already built to a, a high standard and you should actually focus your attentions elsewhere. Um, how do we do that? So we have the risk mapping, we have the star rating, and then we select the critical road sections. Uh, this is one map showing the correlation between the risk mapping and star rating. So actually this is, this is from, uh, from Croatia on the TENT network, also coming in from the SLAME project. And you can see that there is a really strong correlation between the risk mapping, the actual crashes happening, and the star rating, the proactive methodology to identifying 
uh, the the uh, the uh, things which are which are not designed up to the high standard with your road network. And um, when you try to actually identify some sections, which I said on on this one example from uh, the town of Split to to the town of Omish, uh, with the creation methodology of identifying um, uh, dangerous sections. Uh, we were uh, asked to do uh, the prioritization based on the 300 meter uh, sections. So what we did here, we actually uh, mapped and did risk mapping on 300 meter sections. So every 300 meter sections was assigned with the crashes that happened at the actual locations because uh, we wanted to get statistically more relevant information we included all types of crashes not only fatal crashes. so it was fatal crashes serious crashes slight injury and uh, crashes without injury only only uh, damage to the vehicles so all crashes were included into these uh, calculations and they were weighted of course the, the fatal crashes had a um, stronger weight than the, the one without injuries and uh, divided by the number of vehicles going to travel and this is how it looks so so basically you had some 300 meters which were in high risk and the other uh, uh, coming to medium, uh, uh, low and uh, uh, low medium risk, and of course low risk. And uh, after that, uh, a star rating was also done on the same uh, section. And you can see here how parts of the road are actually in four star, but only less than one kilometer. The majority of the road is actually a two star road, but there are also one star road sections uh, present. If we look at the actual graph of 100 meter sections, you can now see in red color how the risk bands based on the crashes actually changed on the road from very high to very low. And also in the yellow color, you can see how the star rating, the proactive analysis of the road also changed from high to uh, from, from one star to, to four star, uh, which was the best score achieved on the current section. So, even visually, you can see here that there is a correlation on some segments where there is a clear correlation, as I uh, explained in my metrics, that uh, there is a link between uh, accidents actually happening and deficiency detected in the road infrastructure. And if we do a uh, cumulative graph, so if we do, if we put um, the road sections from the, the, the highest correlation where you have a very high uh, risk uh, coming from the actual accidents happening to a very high risk coming from the star rating to be on the uh, uh, right side of the, of the graph. And on the left side, you have roads which are low risk and very good in terms of star rating. Then you can create um, a graph like this. And what we normally would do in um, transport engineering, we would select somewhere here. So where, where the graph is actually changing from a slowly rising to rapidly rising. And then it means that you can randomly choose your percentiles, whether it is the 85th percentile, whether it is the, the 70th percentile, 50th percentile, it depends on the uh, investment that is actually available to you. And then you can actually prioritize the sections from the ones that are very likely to have the highest return if you do some investments on the road. And here on this example, we actually showed uh, just a few locations where we could expect to have a very high return rates. Uh, I hope I didn't take too much time. And um, uh, if there are any questions, I'm uh, here to answer it for you. Thank you very much, Marco. Since there are not questions as yet, I, I wanted to address to you the same question to, as, uh, as to Brian, because he was also interested in uh, learning what you would respond to that. But I will put it a little bit uh, differently in terms of what resources are required in order an institution to be able to do a crash risk mapping. What would you suggest to the countries that would like to do uh, crash risk mapping, to start to initiate crash risk mapping, uh, how to start, how to start. Brian mentioned the planning, proactive approach, cooperation yeah. with, with public authorities. Is there something that you would advise countries? Yeah, definitely. I, uh, one of the things which is, which is definitely the biggest problem in, in, in most of the countries when they decide to do 
uh, risk mapping is to collect the uh, accurate accident data. That's something which uh, is always a problem. I, I in, in, in my uh, experience uh, doing this in several countries here in uh, Southeastern Europe, uh, we always had a problem um, collecting accurate locations. So sometimes you have uh, databases, excellent databases, which you cannot really map to the roads, or this mapping is actually not very precise. And then um, there is a lot of struggle with that. But if you have accurate uh, crash data, and if you have uh, accurate ADT volumes, it is actually very simple. So it's not time consuming. The time consuming is the data collection, but actually doing the map is, is, is a relatively straightforward process. Thank you, Marco. There are some comments uh, for both you and Brian about a uh, very interesting presentation, but one question from Stuart Flower. Uh, why did you decide 300 meter section and how did you determine the weightings of severity from damage only to fatality? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a really good question. And uh, of course, the 300 meters was something uh, I would say historical. So when we were doing the, the black spot analysis uh, in Croatia 20 years ago, 30 years ago, in, in some manuals, the 300 meter was something that was defined as a as a as a location. So so uh, for this is basically the the number we got uh, from the road authorities. They are now using the move, moving uh, window methodology, but they are all, all also uh, doing it on a 300 meter stretch so that's why we chose uh, 300 meter and based on the weighting uh, I, I don't have the actual numbers now but um, we basically used a uh, very similar uh, uh, rates as, as um, described in the international uh, literature so uh, usually if you have one fatal accident um, this, this means that on the same location you would have somewhere between eight and ten or twelve. Uh, uh, serious injuries and uh, times 10 the slight injuries so that's something that that we used um, as an average uh, of course we didn't have uh, uh, the actual studies but we used uh, the let's say average international experience great thank you very much marco for your excellent presentation and uh, for answering the questions there is a uh, yet another question um, that brings us to the end, and that's uh, if the presentation will be shared via email. Uh, yes, we will share the material presented here by, e by emails to all uh, participants, uh, but also video recordings will be on Eurorap uh, webpage uh, from next week. Um, if there are no questions at the moment, as I see, I don't see ones. Um, I would like to say that I hope that these two presentations have really inspired you and uh, to repeat that if you want to start risk mapping in your country, please get back to us and we are happy to support and help you with that. Uh, our next online seminar uh, on 7th December is a research and innovation hot topic event on AI RAP and this will be led by Monika Olishlagers, who is IRAP's Global Innovation Manager and City Specialist. Uh, we would kindly like to invite you and uh, to listen and hear more about uh, the development in the sphere of uh, AI RAP and how this can help improving road safety in the future globally, but also in Europe. Uh, thank you very much for participation in this seminar. We are looking forward uh, to your comments. Uh, and any questions that you may have and you didn't have time uh, to post them now uh, and, uh, and see you on 7th of December. Thank you very much and goodbye.